but I wanted to jump into an example. And you just had a paper come out recently about a new sort of bot that we didn't talk about last time in September. And that is the, the Anthrobot. Mm -hmm. What's the Anthrobot? <laughs> Yeah, um, so so I'll tell you what it is. Uh, just to be clear, um, we have not yet made any claims about where these bots sit on the spectrum of cognition, um, and uh, and 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 the reason is is because you you can't just um, have feelings or pre-commitments about these things. You have to do experiments, and those experiments are still underway. So what we've shown is um, you might you might remember the Xenobots, which which uh, we created. Um, uh, a few years ago, and, and those were made of frog cells. And these are basically the idea of uh, uh, liberating some number of epithelial cells from a frog embryo, and they will uh, re, uh, sort of re-aggregate into a, into a, a self-motile little structure, which, which, we, which is, among other things, a biorobotics platform, so we call it a xenobot. So, and, and then it has certain, um, certain behaviors and, and, and properties and so on. Um, one of the things that uh, some people said at the time was, well, we know amphibians are plastic. We know embryos are plastic. So the fact that these cells are doing these interesting things, uh, the, it, what if it's a, um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a one-off result. It's, it's a frog embryo. In fact, in fact, people, people said, uh, why do you need a new term Xenobot? These look like animal caps. Animal caps are is something that uh, developmental biologists who study frogs have been uh, s seeing for a long time. It's the ectoderm from a frog uh, embryo that is uh, once you take it off the embryo is able to differentiate into different things and it's ciliated and it sort of wiggles around and so on. And so this is just a, this is an animal cap. You don't you don't need another word. But that's that's the power of uh, of terminology here in terms of facilitating or preventing future work. Because if you think of this as a frog specific thing and you call it a uh, you call it a, uh, a, a an animal cap. What you're not going to do is try to do the same thing from human cells, and that's exactly what we did. And that's because we wanted to. So I wanted to show an example of something that isn't embryonic. It isn't amphibian. It has it's, it has nothing to do with being an animal cap. It is a more fundamental. Uh, capacity of cells with a perfectly normal genome to do new things, and so so we went as far away from uh, from the frog, and so uh, and so what what we wanted to do was uh, uh, see see how much of that plasticity uh, was was generic and 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 went beyond what embryonic cells and um, and 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 frog cells uh, could do, and so this is uh, this is a new um, uh, a new paper. Uh, the first author is Gizem Gumushkaya, who's a PhD student in my group, and then a whole other. Um, there there are many uh, other people on that on that team. Lots of lots of folks who uh, who participated in that in that research. And so what what we what we did was to take uh, uh, lung epithelium cells from human patients, and these are adults. In fact, most of the time they're fairly el elderly adults. Um, and we take these cells and there's a particular process that um, Gizem puts them through. And at the end, they uh, become basically, they look a lot like a xenobot in the sense that they are this, these spherical things with cilia on the outside. And they use those cilia to row against the, the, flu the fluid, the medium that they're in. And they move around and they have different interesting behaviors. They have different um, uh, uh, classes of shapes that they can make. And then maybe the most kind of bombshell result in that paper at the end is that if you put them on top of um, a layer of human peripheral nerve um, and then that you've put a scratch through, right? So, so, you, so you make a monolayer of neural cells in, in culture, you take a scalp and you just scratch, put a scratch through it. It's, you know, it's a simple model of wound healing, you know, these, these scratch, um, scratch wound cultures. Um, if, you put the, if, you, if you put the anthrobots there, what they will do is settle down in a particular location across that scratch and four or so days later, if you pick them up, what you'll see is that underneath what they've done is they've taken the two sides of the wound and they've healed it together so that there's now a bridge, the neuronal bridge that, that connects where roughly where they were sitting. And so, so this idea, you know, and so, so, so I love it because these are, these are, um, standard cells with, uh, they're, they're standard adult cells with a normal human genome. If you see, um, you know, I'm starting to do talks on this. And when I do the talks, I normally show this little thing running around and doing its thing. And I ask people, what do you think this is, right? It looks like something you got out of a pond somewhere, you know, some sort of primitive organism. And then I say, well, we've, we, we know what the genome looks like. And uh, the genome is actually homo sapiens. Uh, and, and this idea that your tracheal cells are sitting there quietly for your whole lifetime, 
And then if they were given a chance to uh, reboot their multicellularity, they could actually repair your neural cells and who knows what else. I mean, we're going to test a million other things. That was just the first thing we, we tested. Uh, Right. Like who knew they could do that? You know, it's 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 an amazing thing. And, and once you never find out. And if you and if you th and if you think of these things as one off results or as, you know, animal caps or anything like that, you don't you, you're not motivated to do the next experiment. And that's that's the, the power of um, conceptual unifying conceptual frameworks that say, you know, there's something fundamental here. Um, and that's and that's what these anthrobots are. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm making no claims whatsoever about where these anthrobots are on the spectrum of cognition. Well, we're certainly going to find out, and we're doing that with Xenobots too. We're asking these questions: Are they trainable? Do they learn? If they so, if they learn, what kinds of paradigms can they be trained in? Uh, do they have preferences? Do they what what other behaviors do they have? No, none of this is obvious any more than knowing that actually, um, given the opportunity, they could go out and heal uh, de defects in peripheral innervation. Any more than that's obvious. These are all things that we have to discover. We're not we're not good at um, predicting them from scratch. Mm. One of the things that I, I love about you and your work in your lab. I was telling a friend of mine after our first conversation to listen to the episode, and it's that you are as close to a mad scientist as huh. I've I've come in, in looking at anybody's research, but in a great way. Uh, and it's very cool. Uh, hearing about every experiment, every paper you write, it's always really neat. Uh, oh, so well, thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, so thank I, I mean, I, I agree. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, but you know, mad scientist is, is, is fine. Um, the part of it, the part of it I, I enjoy and lean into is the idea that all of the interesting stuff for me is around the bound, the boundaries of things that we didn't think were possible of the were places where we thought, uh, specific theories don't extend to, um, you know, in, in particular, uh, plasticity and, and cognition in surprising places. Um, all of that leads to breaking expectations. And that, that's the part that looks really, uh, crazy to, you know, to people after, after the fact, you know, after, after the fact, um, you can, you can always come up with, with explanations for these things. But, but the question is, what kind of theory got you to do the experiment in the first place? And in my group, that's one of the things I love the most about my lab and, and the people in it is that uh, we do all we do.